<clears throat> Should we wait a couple minutes to get started here? Seems like some people are still joining in, so. Yeah, it's fine with me. I'm just sitting in the airport. All right. I can't see you, Evan. You're not there. <laughs> I haven't turned on my video yet. <laughs> if I see you, it's good to see you. I'm right here. I just saw you, what, an hour or two ago? I know, right? Here I am now. Awesome. Hopefully the background noise isn't too bad here at the uh, the airport. All right, I'll turn on my video. Like I hate looking at myself, man. <laughs> All right, that's me. There you go. Look at you. At the airport. <laughs> Found a nice quiet place to sneak away, huh? Well, I don't know. There was just a whining kid who just got on that spirit <laughs> plane to Houston. So we're good now. Uh, that was my kids at the airport yesterday running around like crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it sort of stinks when they misbehave and you can't get them to just quiet a little bit. I mean, I get it, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Kids are kids. Are you, are you at the main terminal? Or are you at the terminal two? No, main terminal. Because I have to go. Oh, to, I have to go to that, Canada. Oh, there's that cool observation deck. If you're over in the, uh, oh, is it the A concourse? They have like a second story you can climb. It's very hard to find. There's a secret staircase, and then you can go up top, and there's windows you can look out. You got some time to kill. Hmm. I don't know. My plane starts boarding at four. You should totally go look for it. There won't be any screaming kids up there. Well, maybe there will, but at least you have a cool view of the airport. And that's at Terminal 1, this Linda it's at, Terminal? It's, yep, it's at Terminal 1. It's I think it's the A. So it's like where the old McDonald's used to be. Was that A? I don't know, man. I don't uh, like flying out of Terminal 1. I'm a Terminal 2 kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I like it a little quieter, a little direct right through security. So True. I fly southwest whenever I can, but Southwest doesn't go to Canada. Mm. So I have to take Air Canada. Air Canada, we stay. <laughs> That's not the right song, I don't think. That's, not quite. You're good. So my apologies to the Canadians uh, who might be online. I didn't mean to make fun of your uh, national anthem. So people get offended by stuff. All right. Time we got. It's 2.02. Two. All right. Think we should get started? Sure. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you to uh, FR Secure's April Hangout with Evan. Um, it's actually not just a hangout with Evan this time because we've brought Brian McGowan on board. Um, he's a product and security operations lead for Security Studio, which is a partner of FR Secure. Um, if you can't tell, Evan's in the airport right now, so uh, he brought Brian along so that we can kind of bounce some ideas off each other. Um, just to get started with a few ground rules like we always do, um, everybody's been muted uh, from the beginning of the, of the hangout here, but if you have a question or want to want to talk to Brian or talk to Evan, um, feel free to use the either the chat feature or the hand raise function. Um, I can certainly unmute you at any point and then we can have you ask your question or, or submit a discussion um, to Evan or Brian that way. Um, today we're going to be talking about shaky foundations, um, which is part of, you know, Evan's book, um, building, building your information security program kind of from the ground up. So with that, I will uh, pass it off to Evan and Brian. And thanks again for, for joining. Brian. Yes. Good <laughs> afternoon. Good. It's good to, uh, I, I invited you because I thought it'd be cool more to have a discussion. Uh, you know, one of the things I didn't really like so much about um, you know, the hangouts before is I felt like I was sort of just lecturing, you know, I wasn't getting any uh, feedback. So now I get to have you and me, we can have a discussion. Um, uh, yeah. So welcome. Nice. Glad you're here. Thanks. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm pretty excited about it. I, I, I love the book. This is a great topic. So I'm super excited to talk about it. Awesome, man. <laughs> so as you know, I'm in the airport, I'm on my way to Toronto, uh, 
you know, I was hoping I could do this from the office, but I guess it's sort of cool because, you know, security guys, you know, and gals, we travel all the time, you know, we're never kind of in one spot. So I guess it's the way we hang out. That's true. Otherwise we wouldn't get a chance to talk at all because you're busy trying to help fight the fight, right? Well, just like you and just like all the unicorns at FR Secure and Security Studio. All right. So uh, this is about, so last week, I don't know if you saw, or last month, um, the first chapter of the book, you know, the book is to fix a broken, or the broken, hold on. The information security industry is broken. (laughs) It's not like I didn't write the book or anything. Yeah, Yeah, you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, chapter one was about, uh, you know, we're not speaking the same language and, you know, part of the, the two central themes, I think there, uh, well, there's a lot of themes, but two central themes are, you know, when I ask people to give me their definition of information security, uh, it varies across the board. If I ask normal people, right, people who aren't in our industry, um, hacking, internet security. I mean, they call it all kinds of things, right? So we got that problem. Uh, we got the problem within our own organizations and then we got the problem, you know, even within our own tribe, right? And so uh, I think Rick from Long-Term Care Group was on the phone that session and brought up some good points, right? He, his definition of information security varied from my definition. In, in what ways more specifically or like uh, targeted into different areas or? Uh, he, well, he married it up, I think, more with, you know, privacy, you know, where I view privacy as being a subset of information security, you know, mm, the definition sure. being, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability using administrative, physical, and technical controls. Um, the, uh, so privacy to me is confidentiality of one type of data. Yep. So I would fit privacy inside of security. And so I wanted to be really careful to not invalidate other people's definitions, right? Because God forbid I have, you know, the ultimate definition, <laughs> but it, it, it drove home the point. Mm-hmm. We're not speaking the same language and it's really nope. important to do that. Yep. So, I agree. You got to have the same, you got to have the same understanding if you're going to be able to share any sort of real information or even be able to measure. So right it's critical that we understand what each other's talking about we just say things like i got, i have good security really what does that mean and what when you think about security doesn't mean the same thing i do okay. i think there's an air that's not my air, <laughs> airline <laughs> so you're right and uh and one of the things that you know you and i have been around a while you know i've been in in, in this for a long time and one of my biggest challenges is communicating to executive management and people who aren't like us that information security is a business issue. It's not an IT issue. Mm -hmm. And we've made so much progress over the years. You know, we're we're starting to get board communications. We're starting to get communications with the CEOs of companies and it's just great. And then now I feel like we're we're regressing a little bit because now when you see in the news, you see cyber security, Mm, IT security, well, that's kind of taking us back to, I mean, if you look up the definition of cyber, it's technology, right? Yep. And so we're anyway, that's, that was chap, that was last month. That was last month. Well, you know, but that one's never over. I think that will be the continuing discussion forever in information security. And especially like you said, it's, it's difficult because what most people think about is whatever was on the news last week or whatever the hot topic is in the, in the kind of security space right now. And it's sometimes easy to forget about the things that are maybe just as critical, but aren't quite as sexy or new. You know, we're still facing the same old battles of we need to do better training. We need to do better education. We need to have better onboarding, offboarding processes. Like all that stuff is just as important, but it's not very fun. And it isn't, uh, it isn't newsworthy maybe all the time. Sexy, sexy sells, man. And so that brings us to chapter two of the book, which is, you know, bad foundation or no foundation or shaky foundation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and in, in that chapter of the book, you know, I really equate building a security program to building a building or building a house. Mm-hmm. Right. And you've, I mean, you remember like when you bought your last house, you had people yeah. over for a housewarming party, you know, and you know, well, so, excited to show it off. 
This was a good story, though, because I read this section in the book, and I just need yeah. to tell you right now, I, I don't know if you remember, but when I came to your house, you actually did bring me to the foundation right away. It was one of the first places. Well, I'm a foundation guy, guy, right? <laughs> So well, I thought it was pretty funny when you said that because I was like, that's actually exactly what happened when I went to see Evan's new house. Right. Well, and okay, so my house was built in 1872, mm -hmm. right? So you have to have a solid foundation true. for it to last. And the same thing happens in information security. Uh, people don't like working on foundational components of an information security program. It's not sexy. You know, when I have a housewarming party, unless you come over to my house, those people, you know, aren't showing off the foundation. They're showing off, uh, you know, the bonus room or, you know, the, the mm -hmm. paint schemes or, you know, whatever else, right? The stuff on the surface. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people don't get excited about foundations. But how do you build a, a house or a building or a security program or anything lasting without a solid foundation? Mm hmm it's true. And it's, it's, it's bound to fail if you don't, just like a tangible construction project, right? If you don't have a good foundation, it's not going to work out. It might look good for a little while, uh, but it's, it's bound to come tumbling down at some point. Yeah. And so, and you and I have been doing consulting. We've consulted with, you know, hundreds of companies over the years. And I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen a solid information security foundation. Mm-hmm. Right. And I mean, where I'm going today, uh, a global company, uh, very well respected, very successful, high growth and no security no. foundation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. It's so, true. Or, and sometimes the security foundation comes out of, uh, whatever the interest of the person who maybe started the program was right. And, Sometimes it's technical, right? You see a foundation built on some kind of a solution. Maybe we, we started off here and we bought this product and now we're going to, that's how we're going to build our program. And that's usually not successful from what I've seen. Yeah. Well, and you, I mean, I get it, right? It's human nature. I mean, foundations aren't sexy. They are mm -hmm. hard work. It is heavy lifting, uh, you know, all those things. So what is then, you know, and then this is kind of what I go through in the book. What is a foundation? you know, for information security. And so you start with, you know, just like I would start when I'm building a building, you know, what are the blueprints? What's the plan? You know, what are we trying to accomplish with our information security program? That's step one, right? I mean, you could define that as you go, I suppose, and a lot of people probably do, you know, like making additions onto their house or their security program, but you still need to have some sort of plan because you, you're, I assume that most of us aren't gonna do this in a vacuum all by yourself. You don't just wave a magic wand and things happen, right? I mean, people need to get on board. People need to do things. You need to go get budget. You need to do all this stuff that requires a plan. Mm -hmm. Should. It should have a plan. Well, <laughs> and you should know where you're going, right? You want to be able to see more than just what am I going to finish today? You want to be able to see where am I going to be in six months or a year? Right. So, you know, again, if you're using your house analogy, we wouldn't start building by just grabbing some lumber and starting to nail it together, right? We would want to have some sort of structure in mind of where we're going and what it's going to look like and how many bedrooms are there going to be and where's the fireplace going to go so that we make sure that we don't put it where we can't, uh, where we're going to have something flammable right next to it. So you have to have a plan. I agree. Otherwise, you're sort of building like a hodgepodge of right. just point solutions, right? So let me ask you this. So in in the years of consulting that you've done and the companies that you've worked with, mm -hmm. uh, is it common or is it uh, uncommon to find companies that have a good strategic information security plan? Oh, it's very uncommon. I'd say it's, it's very likely that there's a, like I said, a bunch of, a bunch of kind of cobbled together things that they think is a security program, mm -hmm. but it's hard work. I think that might be the kind of the underlying is it's, it's hard work and it's, mm -hmm. And it takes time to build a good foundation. And that is something that a lot of organizations struggle with. Uh, and it's not always because they don't want to. A lot of times it's because they're busy trying to fight the fight the problems. Um, and that's where it sort of maybe becomes almost um, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because if you don't start with a good plan and you try to just be reactive to everything that pops up, you spend so much time playing whack-a-mole with all the problems that you're finding that you never really get to where you want to go. So you have to sometimes take the time to step back and plan, even if it doesn't feel like 
that's the best expense of your time right at the moment. You have to have that program and that plan in mind or else you just never get out of the firefight. You're just constantly just banging your head against the wall every day. Yeah, and how many times, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard information security people or IT people because typically, you know, people do treat still information security like it's an IT issue. It usually reports up to an IT function and, you know, what have you, and I get that. But the thing I hear a lot is, you know, it always seems like we're firefighting, always firefighting, always mm-hmm. firefighting. And at some point, I think in order to get out of that firefighting mode, you have to figure out st- more strategic plans, uh, starting with foundations and then, you know, and then build the first floor and then build the second floor and, you know, progresses, you know, through the security program. Not that you stop doing the firefighting, right? Because you have to keep the business running. So it's almost like you have to juggle this. Mm-hmm. But I don't sure. see any other way to really do it correctly if you don't build, if you don't start with a plan. Nope, I 100% agree. I've never seen anyone be successful trying to not start without a plan. So we start with the blueprints, translated to our information security strategic plan. Uh, Our plan, you know, probably usually we start with, uh, you know, some sort of an assessment to figure out where we're currently at to establish some sort of a baseline and then build a strategic plan from that, right? And that would be our Mm -hmm our blueprints, right? Yep. The next thing we need to do with our blueprints, which is the same thing that I would do if I was building a house in, in my city, is I need to go take it and get permits, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody needs to permit me to do what I want to do, build something. The same thing happens in a security program. You need to take it to executive management. You know, is there going to be permission to build an information security program? We're going to need them to participate. Uh, we communicate a lot of our planning, and I call them the rules for the game, and like our information security policies. Mm-hmm. Right? That's the yeah, point for sure. for me to do stuff. If I don't have anything in policy, that means management hasn't given me the authority to do it. That's kind yep. of always the way I've seen it. Nope, I think you're right, and you hear a lot. Uh, you hear a lot sometimes of people pointing fingers when something bad happens and they say, well, this person didn't do what our policy said. And my answer is usually, well, were they aware? Because if they didn't know, you've set that person up for maybe not failure, but definitely for them to be risky, right? Without a policy in place, you're leaving the individual up to make the best decision they can make at the time they come to that problem, given what they think they should do. And a lot of times that's not where we want our people to find themselves, right? We don't want them to be making a, a, um, a, a, a split decision in the middle of the game on what the next play is going to be. You want them to have a clear understanding of what the rules are. And uh, you can't blame them for trying. Most people don't do the wrong thing because they want to or because they're intentional about it. They do it because they just don't have the right information or they aren't at the right time or they're under pressure and they pick what they think given what they have is the best plan, which isn't always what we want them to do. So you got to have a policy, right? One, well, we, I think we've traditionally used policies incorrectly as well. Right, and I last night I was teaching, uh, you know, our, our CISSP Metro program. It was the third class or whatever, and I was talking about you know policies. And I asked the class, you know, how many of you work in companies that have uh, that make you sign a statement or acknowledge mm-hmm. that you've read and understood your policies? Yep. And almost every hand in the class went up, and I said, so everybody's lying, right? Because <laughs> nobody reads yep. it. So you use policies like the, like you use uh, like if you're going to have a house party, right? So let's go with the same whole the same analogy. I'm going to have a bunch of people over to my house, and we're going to play this new board game that nobody's played before, mm-hmm. right? And so you you take uh, you know somebody reads the rules, right? Not everybody reads the rules. Mm-hmm. And one guy in the class actually said, "Yeah, everybody in our family does." I'm like. I th- you got kind of a really that's a family. That's weird. No, in my family, no one wants to read the rules. Right. So one will, person, one person has to finally pick up the rule book and understand it, right? Right. And so I've always viewed that as me as being me. You know, I'm the CISO. Mm-hmm. I read the rules. I understand the rules. It's my job to disseminate the rules, and 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 to just ensure the game is played according to the rules, mm-hmm. right? And there's lots of different ways to do that, but you know, using that board game analogy. Um, I teach everybody else how to play the game. We get started. We play the game. When people have questions about certain aspects of the game, we go back to the rules and we use them as reference documents. And that's mm-hmm. the same way policies you know, are meant to be used. 
to expect everybody to read policies is ludicrous and it, it's never worked you know it really never will they're kind of boring right yeah i think like so well, if you, board game right well if you, if you imagine playing a board game i, I we, this happened to us a couple of weeks ago we pulled out a game that we had never played before and everybody sort of stared at the board because it was clue but it was harry potter clue and there's a different set of rules for harry potter clue evidently so oh. You know, first we open the box. We think we're going to play it because everybody knows how to play Clue. And there's all these pieces that don't make sense. And we're like, well, what are these? No one knows. So then my wife grabbed the instructions and tried to read it. And about 10 minutes in, she just hands it. She's like, I don't get it. You're going to have to figure this out. So so then I then I took a stab at it. And even I was confused. But it's like you said, you know, eventually we start to gain a basic understanding. You play a little bit through the game. You run into a roadblock. You pull out the clue. You pull out the instructions again. Okay, what were we supposed to do when this happens? Oh, yes. That's how that works. Um, cause again, the worst thing that can happen is you get to a situation in the game where you're not sure what to do and then you improvise, right? You decide on making up something that isn't in the game. Yep. Now you're not following the rules anymore, which is fine, I guess, as long as nothing bad happens. But. Or you can change the rules. I mean, at least when you're a CISO, uh, or somebody who can influence the rules for the game, I mean, you can change the rules, right? True. To make them fit the game you're playing at your company and this goes alongside with you know we know that training and awareness you know the big thing today in our industry about training and awareness to make it more effective is gamification mm -hmm. right so this fits really well if, you, if people think of you know running an information security program like playing a game mm -hmm. you know it makes it i think you know that's the mentality anyway but i think it's great the only other thing i was going to say is and it's just like playing a game in that if you decide to to modify the rules you quickly take a poll of everyone in the game and you say is this going to be something everybody agrees to um another example you're playing monopoly and some people like to put money in the middle when you get uh what, so that you can collect it when you get free parking some people don't that's just a kind of a an engagement rule right does everybody want to play with that rule or not and everybody says yes and then you do it it's sort of like a, a waiver system from a policy if we're going to deviate from what the rules are um, does everybody understand that rule and is everybody on board with it? And if we're all good with it and we approve it, then we can play that way. Exactly. All right. So continuing with this foundation piece, the first thing are plans, right? Our blueprints. And then we need to have permits, building permits. Uh, we need to have budget. We need to have executive buy-in. We need to have, oh, yeah. uh, other people need to join us kind of in this mission, uh, permit us to do the things that we want to do with information security. And then we start laying a foundation. So what are the foundational components of an information security program? And I take this from a logical approach. You know, number one, foundationally, I can't secure the things I don't know I have. Right. If I don't know, right. And so if I don't know what I'm responsible to protect, how can I be effective in protecting it? So a foundational component to an information security program is asset management. Mm-hmm. It has to be. Right. And so I need an asset inventory, right? And so when I ask most organizations, do you have an asset inventory? This, you know, and I think of assets as three things, mm -hmm. physical, mm -hmm. software, and data. Yep. Most people do, uh, I don't know, better than the others, job at physical assets. Yeah. There's yep. asset tags. They might know where most of their things are. When you talk about mobile devices, it gets a little bit funkier. When you talk about, um, mm -hmm. think of flash drives. Flash drives are hardware. Well, yeah, most, right. Most, most people not tracking those. <laughs> no. No. Uh, USB hard drives, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many different assets that are floating around our organization that we don't have an inventory of. There's no man management of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think of asset management, it's not just having an inventory. It's also the processes that manage the inventory. Yep. Right. There needs to be an intake process. There needs to be a life cycle process. And there needs to be a disposition process. And that's not sexy. <laughs> that's who, true. It's not. Who wants to do this? But it's foundation, right? It, yeah. The better you get your hands around these things, the more effective your second floor looks, right? When you're talking about data loss prevention or you're talking about putting in, in the, the latest, greatest blinky lights, mm -hmm. right? Those are the sexy things, but they're going to be a lot less effective if I don't have a solid foundation. Mm -hmm. It's 100% true. 
And it has to be, you know, it's like you said, you, you run into a lot of organizations and you say, well, do you have an asset inventory? And yep, totally. I got this spreadsheet right here. Uh, and it's the one that I work with finance on so that they can track all the assets that we're keeping track of from our, uh, used to be from our, you know, from depreciation expense now, not so much as anymore, just so much as capital, capital purchases though, right? Yeah. But that's definitely not the whole piece. And then beyond that, you maybe have oh, 50% now or so of organizations with a software inventory where they're doing something to control what software is in their environment. But usually as soon as you get past those and you get into that third category of information assets or, or uh, data assets, there's sort of that blank look of like, yeah, I don't have any idea what's out there right now. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So not easy, not sexy, but critical. Critical, yes, very much so. And so, um, in in most organizations, when I uh, so applications, so I think physical, they probably do the best at you know when we talk about those three categories. Yep, for sure. Uh, software, a little bit, little worse, but better than data. Yep. Data inventories are. I mean, and I'm talking. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of an organization I'm working with now. I mean, the one I'm going mm -hmm. to talk to, a uh, global company, uh, big. Um, I asked last week, you know, give me a list of the applications that you use in your environment, and, th and they didn't have one. They, they estimated that it was over 200 applications. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. you do internal application development. Give me a list of those applications. No list of those applications. It's like, oh, my God. Right. Okay, so so you know, I mean, it, to me, it just seems common sense. You have to have these things. I have to know what I'm. It is I'm protecting before I can effectively devise strategies to protect it. Um, and what we focused on traditionally in our industry is this crunchy shell concept. Mm -hmm. Right. As long as we keep the bad guys out, I don't have to be all that effective at knowing what assets I have to manage because. There's a, a clear delineation between us and them, and I've got a really crunchy shell. As long as the bad guys don't get in, who cares? Right? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe in the old days, but nowadays that's not maybe the case anymore. Right? You, right. Because your crunchy shell doesn't exist. Unless your crunchy shell is around each user, uh, you have a pro you still have a challenge. Right? It, like right. you said, there's... there's you can't just have that experience of, well, I'm not going to be concerned with what happens inside the perimeter because today the inside is the outside. Well, and breach after breach after breach after breach, we see how easy it is to get past the perimeter. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about things like phishing attacks, you talk about, you know, malicious code, you know, attacks, firewall bypass. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get into the environment, so much so that we, um, on our penetration testing team, Oftentimes, we'll start a penetration test just assuming we've already got internal access. Mm -hmm. It's that easy. Do you want us to go through the exercise? We can, but it's sort of a waste of time. Let's figure out what they can do once they're inside the environment, which right. then brings us to all kinds of other things. Asset inventory becomes a lot more important then. Network mm -hmm. segmentation, network isolation becomes a lot more important. Lateral movement inside the network becomes a lot more important. I mean, it's a whole can of worms. So we got here because we didn't. We just assume that we can keep the bad guys out. We know right. we can't. Mm -hmm. So asset management is is very important. So foundation component number one, asset management. Well, sure, sure. And I and I know you're gonna touch on some of the other things too, but you know, asset management it's it's also foundational from a from if you're thinking about really how you would build the program. I mean you you have to have asset management to support almost all of the other functions you wanna do. You know, I know you're uh, I'm, you're going to talk about other things like change control and access control, but all of those things hinge on understanding who's the asset owner. And you can't have an asset owner if you don't know what the asset is. Uh, I learned this when I was doing my last organization where I was the, the security officer, is that you can't, you can't even begin to build some of these other processes until you've identified who's the owner. And the next question is, well, the owner of what? Well, the owner of the asset. Well, what's the asset? Well, okay, let's, how do we put a box around it, right? And the boxes are always different. Sometimes it's it's as simple as, hey, we have this application and, and you're the person who has the ownership for deciding who's in and out of the application. But other times it's, it's maybe structured data, like a database table or something where you have to decide who's, who's the most responsible in the business for that and how are we going to assign that 
ownership so that we can then know who gets access and who's in charge of maintaining it, all those things that come along with it. Right. And so the fact that it is hard work, the fact that it isn't as simple as, you know, just buying a product, what we do in our, in our industry is just buy a product. Mm -hmm. Right. And we call it lipstick on a pig. Mm. <laughs> yes. We keep dressing it up and that's chapter three. So there's some insight into, into the next chapter uh -huh. of lipstick. the book. Yeah. So, we, you know, it's still a pig and we still keep putting lipstick on it, expecting it to look prettier while it's still a pig. Right. So we shouldn't be yep. surprised at how easy it is to compromise companies and organizations. And we shouldn't be surprised at the long dwell times of attackers in our networks and whatever. So, uh, Foundational component number one, asset management. We're, we're in agreement. Hopefully others are in agreement. If they're not, you know, the people that are in the hangout, if they're not in agreement, let's have a discussion about it. Because uh, either we're wrong or you're wrong or, you know, something needs to be, you know, reconciled. So the second component, foundational component to an information security program, just logically, I think of the things, I can't secure what I don't know I have. I also can't secure the things that I cannot control. Mm -hmm. I have to have some level of control over the assets in order to effectively protect them, right? Um, and this comes into things like access control. This comes in, you know, change control. Again, not sexy stuff, but really, really important. Yes, for sure. Uh, you know, access control, uh, you know, for people who don't know what access control is, it's things like identification, authentication, authorization, uh, accountability, right? It's the, it's it's just the um, the textbook definition of mm -hmm. what access control is. Who should have access to what, and how much access should they have, and how do we account for it? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's interesting. It's interesting that you you know you broke you break those up because a lot of times people hear access control and they automatically just think, well, it's it's privileges, and they just kind of leave it at privileges. But it's not privileges, right? It, it's a combination of who are you, how do I know you are who you say you are, and then how do I know you can do what you're supposed to do? And those things are not all lumped into one, especially as we start looking at cloud solutions and identity federation and all the different things that are happening now today. We, we can't just simply assume that it's as simple as, well, assign Evan administrator privileges. Nope, it's way more nuanced than that, right? Yeah, well, it certainly makes it work, right? I mean, that's the old school way of uh, troubleshooting applications. It's like, oh, I cannot get this application to work. Well, give the service account. Yep. Give the service account. Put it in the domain admin. Does it work? <laughs> yeah, works. All right, we're done. You know, yep. like son of a gun. Uh, yeah, so, and so the fundamental things, you know, around access control, most organizations we work with, and I think most organizations in the world are probably using something like Active Directory or some sort of a centralized directory service or a single sign-on solution, a place where they can manage accounts in, in, a, in, in one place. Right. right. Yep. And so the first thing I would do would be to do an inventory of those accounts, those user accounts, regular user account uh, audits, Review. yep. reviews. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the more, the higher the turnover in an organization, the more changes to the things, the more often I would do the reviews, mm -hmm. right? If I have a very stagnant organization where there's not a lot of turnover, maybe I can get away with annual user account reviews, you know, but if I've got a lot of, t a lot of turnover, maybe five, 10% turnover in the organization, maybe I need to do those things quarterly. Maybe I need to do them monthly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it's, well, it's, go ahead. Well, I'll say it's, it's, it's surprising how many organizations don't do that too. Cause this is a question when I'm talking to organizations about risk assessment, especially is do you do any kind of review? And I hear it just time and time again. No, probably should. They always know they should, but they just don't do it. And it seems daunting, but it's not. I mean, even organizations so that have thousands of users, it's, it's completely doable to go through and just, and understand at least are people, um, are you, do you know who the people are in your system and are they, are they configured properly? And it's, it's one of the simplest things you can do, but it's, it's just another one of those things that it's, it needs to be part of your program. It needs to be part of your cadence. It needs to be something that you focus on. Yeah. I mean, you can automate the entire process. Right? I mean, you can, if you're talking Active Directory, you can script it with PowerShell. Mm -hmm. You can, whatever your HRIS system or your point of truth is going to be in terms of what user accounts or what people are actually employed in the organization, there's some export function in most of those tools. 
it's just a simple reconciliation, you know, almost a diff between the two files. I mean, it, you can make it that simple. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a long drawn out process where, okay, this user, this user, this user, the hardest one, the hardest user account review to do is the first one. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, it's the hardest one to do. And then it gets, it get, just gets easy, you know, and, yep. it, and you start to see the value in it and you'll realize deficiencies in other part of your security program, meaning your onboarding process, mm -hmm. people that, you know, uh, HR sent the email saying that so-and-so is going to be starting next week, yet so-and-so never showed up and so-and-so never started at all. They have oh. a user account, right? Yep. So the user account's an active directory. It never gets disabled because it never went through the termination process. Yep. I had a, I had a customer like this where they had their they had a uh, they had begun to hire a lot of uh, remote working people, and so for simplicity's sake, HR asked if they would start sending out domain credentials ahead of orientation, so those people could VPN in and do the web share for the orientation. What well, turned out when people took accepted their offer, they were shipping these credentials out to them, but then if they didn't actually show up for the first day of work, no one was turning them off. And they had hundreds of, of employees who never actually came to work, who never, you know, they, for whatever reason, they just decided not to accept the job offer, but the accounts never got turned off. They all had remote access still. Like, it's a simple one, right? You can't, you have to, you can't do that. You gotta be on top of it. Right. And so, and you can see now how, when a security program is built correctly, how the processes and the systems work together. Access control is a foundational component, yet there's other components that plug in and, 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 uh, are inputs and outputs from that foundation, mm -hmm. right? Your, your uh, onboarding process, your termination process, you'll notice deficiencies in other processes when you build the foundation correctly. Mm -hmm. it's true. So, so it's just something simple in access control, like using user account reviews, you'll identify deficiencies potentially in your onboarding and your termination process. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times you'll, you'll find... Uh, because that's really the only way usually accounts end up in Active Directory or whatever your directory service is uh, and don't get removed, right? They just end up there somehow magically. Yep. Or you have the, the, the permission creep problem, right? Of Like you said, people over the years have been here and they've needed this and they've needed that. And so someone added their permissions to this application and then added them to this application, but they never actually removed them again. And so by the time they've been in the organization for 10 years, they have access to everything everywhere and no one's ever cleaned up. So that's, that's the other one where I, I you know, a lot of times you talk about um, getting people in this, into the organization and getting them out is good. But when they change roles, do you effectively treat it like a firing and a rehiring? Because you should, so that you're making sure you clean them up too, right? If you're not, there's, the, there's a chance right there that in the middle, those people who just sort of hang around forever could just keep getting permissions added on. Well, that's, and you bring up a great point. I mean, a lot of times when you establish the foundation well, you'll, you'll notice efficiencies or deficiencies and, and be able to make other processes more efficient. You know, you mentioned this change process. I was working with a really large healthcare organization, one that was in the news. It's a big one. And their change process was to, you know, basically print out or dump <laughs> existing permissions and group membership for their old role and then dump the for the new role and then reconcile. Oh, man. It was this long, drawn-out process. And I was like, wouldn't it be simpler just to deactivate? Like, just mm -hmm. remove yep, everything. Yep, remove, start over. And reprovision. Wouldn't that be easier? Would be. Yep. And they're like, yeah. But I guess, you know, sometimes we get stuck – you know, I get, I do the same thing. You get stuck kind of in the trees. Yep. Right. I mean, it's, it's nice when you can be a consultant who hasn't lived through this thing and thought that this is the only way life is done. You, know, you come from the outside and go, uh, why don't you do that? And they're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of the cool things, the quick wins for consulting. Uh, they don't always go like that, obviously, but access control. Okay. So access, uh, and there are tools. Now, if it, if I had errors or I had deficiencies in my foundational components of my security program, this is where I would invest tools and money. Mm -hmm. This is where I would spend money rather than blinky lights on all these other things. You know, when I'm establishing the budget for my information security program, I would focus on the foundational components of my security program. Mm -hmm. Right. And I might have cracks in my foundation. I may have no foundation at all. I still need to have a foundation and it needs to be, you know, shored up. It needs to be solid. Uh, so we talk about access control, uh, and we only talked about a little part of it, 
right? Mm -hmm. User That's accounts. True. We've also got tons of applications that are running in the organization. Some of them aren't tied into a single sign-on solution or aren't tied into Active Directory. Those will also have to be reconciled. You mentioned, you know, the system ownership, application ownership, business ownership, data ownership. Who's responsible for these things? I mean, who's responsible for this application? You know, defining, we don't just have applications in our environment with no ownership, no responsibility. We do, but we shouldn't. Um, so, uh, you know, where my user accounts are and then the rights and the privileges, you know, it, it's not sexy work. It's not easy work, but it is really important. Mm -hmm. um, that's identity. Then we've got authentication, right? Still the easiest way to get into most environments is just a fish. Yep. Just ask you for your credentials and you give them, right? So when I go with single factor authentication, when I go with simple username, password combinations, especially on any externally exposed asset back to our asset management piece. Mm -hmm. to exp I, I, I'm, I'm surprised that those things are not compromised. I'm not surprised when they are. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, right? It's, um, it's almost for sure going to be. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, entirely, it's entirely likely that today there's just no way around it, right? You are going to eventually have someone to not compromise your credentials. So if there's if there's not a better way than just username and password, then right. you might as well. Eventually, you're you're gonna get you're gonna get owned. Yeah, and I, and I would uh, for any of the IT people that are that are listening, I would try this sometime. Put a <laughs> put a um, a Wireshark uh, connection outside, you know, the firewall, and open up an RDP connection, and and see how fast it is before an attacker will find that port thirty three eighty nine is open, and then start running password. <laughs> attack tools uh on those oh it's 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 minutes i mean it's, it's so minutes. fast i personal story right so at home i just installed a and i'm, I'm not a, i don't sell it it's not a product i endorse <laughs> but i just installed a cujo one of these personal home firewalls that's a it's like a little a little home version of an ids and i drop it on the network it sits in between my router and the rest of the network so it watches all the traffic and it started to report immediately on outside IP addresses that were accessing inside resources. One of the things I didn't know I had turned on on my firewall was UPnP, which allows internal devices to make dynamic firewall holes. I had no idea. All of a sudden, like within minutes, all these IP addresses were hitting these resources that were open through the UPnP hole. And how fast it happens, right? I mean, there are... Like you said, now there are organizations, lots of them, good and bad, that are scanning every IP address in the entire IPv4 space publicly. So they'll find you within five minutes, and they'll right. start scanning you right away. So it's crazy. So obfuscation is not going to help. No, and every time a customer calls, uh, or usually, usually they're not customers, but they become customers, you know, because of like a, a compromised, you know, RDP system. Mm -hmm. It's just okay. <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> How many times have we seen that? I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. So authentication, strong authentication. Obviously, there's a lot of different authentication mechanisms that you can use. At a minimum, right, at a minimum, two-factor authentication on all connections originating from the outside, anything that's externally exposed, at a minimum. Yep, for sure. And then if you want to know the next bite to chunk, chunk to bite off, whatever, <laughs> would be your admin accounts. Oh. All privileged accounts, right? Internally and, you know, obviously we've already covered the, the externally. Um, you know, how much time do we have? Am I still, oh, we got 18 minutes. 18 minutes. I'm just getting started. I'm in an airport. I got nothing better to do. <laughs> well, there's, there's lots of interesting stuff going by on the side, so I want to make sure we leave time for them to talk too. Okay, so let's get to the other foundational stuff. So, Access controls, identity, authentication, authorization, and accountability, right? So all those things within your within your environment. And I would never expect an organization that's actually currently running a business to stop everything and fix the foundation. Mm -hmm. That's overwhelming. It's very, very difficult to do. I've never actually seen it done successfully. Instead, what you do is you take chunks. Yep. Take digestible chunks. Start with a, a, an application. Mm -hmm. St you know, start with uh, uh, a suite of applications. Start with a network segment. Start with 
something and then expand out from there. Yeah, well, and, and it ties back to your your uh, beginning point about the, the blueprints and the permits, right? If you can find uh, an application champion or someone who's really good with security, who's really an advocate, and you can bring them on board and you can prove that it works, then it helps socialize for the rest of the organization, right? So if you see one application really succeeding, then you can start to bring more applications on board. And that's I've seen that personally a lot. If you can just find one good application owner to be your champion, everyone else will sort of come along. That's right. So I can't secure what I don't know I have, asset management. I can't secure what I cannot control. Talked about access control. The other component is change control because mm -hmm. unauthorized changes to your environment can quickly make a secure system, a secure application, a very insecure system, mm -hmm. insecure application. So getting your hands around configuration management, change control, those things marry together, marry to asset management, right? Again, fundamental foundational things that are not easy to do. I would never say that. I just flip a switch, find the easy button, smack it, and you're good. I mean, you do have to do this, but if you do it well and you support it well, you don't have to, the hardest time is the first time. Yep. Well, and it's just like you said, there's a, there's a progression here, right? So now once we have our asset management, we know what we have and we know who owns it. Now we can apply access controls because we know who to ask to make sure that the access controls are appropriate for the users. And then when we want to move to change control, we know who to ask again because they're the one who's likely going to be impacted by the change we're going to make. Right. I'm, I'm always really sad for organizations when I hear they don't have a change control process because I think it leaves the IT team sort of swinging in the wind because they're trying to do the best they can, but if they don't have a defined owner and that owner's not involved in what's happening, then when it goes south, they're going to get put on the spit and roasted over it. And that's, that's again, you know, like you said, you want a consensus. You want everyone to be on board. You want to, uh, you want the organization to all play together. So you're a lot more successful when you have uh, the, the other users, especially the key stakeholders behind you when you're doing changes or when you're doing. Right. So the, the concepts are simple, right? The implementation of the concepts are not. Potentially, am I having a connection issue? Oh no. we do things I I totally and agree how do you respond to that well I totally agree and, and here's how I usually start that conversation because it happens a lot when we're talking with with organizations about risk management we say uh, change control is important I again you know kind of like I said to Evan I think it's important because it helps uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page when we're making changes but it's also important 
because it helps us to keep track of what happened and why. So if I was to design the most basic change management program, I, I would, uh, first off, I agree with you, Robert, like the, the feeling of, oh, that's too much process, that's too much procedure, that's going to be all this effort. That's not valuable for anyone. We don't want to create work just to create work. But let's start with something simple. Let's start with just for every change we're going to make, I want to write down who asked for it, why they asked for it, and how I would know it's going to be successful if I make it. Maybe that's all I start with. Uh, you know, maybe I also document, you know, what the what the testing plan is or something. But it's it's simple, and it could start with just an easy spreadsheet. Um, in my case, my last operations team, we started down a road of um, using a, uh, a almost like a software defect. We had Jira. We had we already had a software group who was using Jira, so we just created a new Jira project. We said for every change someone asks for, we're going to create a ticket, and in that ticket, we're going to document why we're doing it and what the what we expect to happen, and then our only change control process was another person on the team had to look at the ticket and say, yeah, makes sense to me too, what you're going to do. And that was enough to get us started. And it got us into the cadence then of, of being better about tracking changes. So that's what I tell everybody is don't try to solve the problem with the, with a comprehensive, imagine a uh, massive solution right off the bat, start with something simple and just get the things that you really want to know. For most organizations, that's enough. But now we have a couple of things when we have that, right? We have, a, we have a way to historically review why we did what we did. And we also have some information. So if we do lose a key resource, we know, uh, we know why they made the changes and we can, we can understand what the business need was so we're not left questioning. Um, it happens a lot in organizations today where talent turns over and we lose that history and that, um, that kind of uh, knowledge that we had in our team. So it's a good thing to, to keep track of. Awesome. Thanks. That really helps. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, Brian. I'm back. Oh, hey, are you back? There you are. I wasn't sure if uh, maybe the airport Wi-Fi was over for you. <laughs> the internets are very hard. No, I'm actually tethered. I don't know what happened. I don't trust airport Wi-Fi. No, nah, I wouldn't trust it at all. There's only about 17 uh, honeypots probably running in the five feet around you trying to collect your information. You know, if I was malicious, I'd play, but I, that's not a game I can play. <laughs> Robert just mentioned, or the phone chargers. I got to tell you, those things are like the worst for me because I'm always the guy with no battery and I feel like I want to plug in, but there's just no way I'm going to plug my phone into some random USB port in the airport. And Well, you bring the uh, brick though, don't you? Uh, I just don't use, I use, I usually use my computer as a brick. So I, then I <laughs> plug oh. my computer into the power, plug my phone into the computer, but yeah. I'm bad at target, yeah, target rich environments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So what were we talking about? Were we done talking about foundation change control? We, we just had a little bit more change control talk while you were away and you know, kind of how you can get into it without it being a massive, um, a massive exhaustion of your resources and especially at an impact on your culture, on the organization. Uh, I think Robert brought up a good point, which is that some organizations, push it to the point where it feels like there's so much extra effort involved in getting a change through, but then they don't do it. And I think you have a great section in the book about this where you talk about how that's a block, right? If you build a process that's too difficult, people are going to end run around it and that isn't successful either. Right. Right. And so that requires, you know, constant input, constant feedback, constant working with the business. You know, I don't, nobody understands how business processes work other than the, people he actually using the business process right mm -hmm. so me being a security guy I don't know the challenges that accounting goes through in issuing checks right but I do know that I can make it difficult for them if I put too much control in place mm -hmm. right I mean a business is a business to make money and so if a control if information security gets in the way of a company making money it's probably the wrong control yep. same thing goes with change control and I think one of the biggest challenges I see with change control and one of the biggest difficulties is organizations who try to do it perfect out of the gate. They try to get it, you know, and again, start small if you have to and learn the lessons, you know, when you've started small, maybe a single application, maybe a single server, maybe a single group of servers, and then slowly expand it out with the things that you've learned over time, you know, and eventually you've got an enterprise wide change control process mm -hmm. at a minimum, the critical assets, should have should be protected by change control assuming mm -hmm. i know what my critical assets are 
<laughs> we hope so. So yeah, change control. So the last part of the foundation, uh, you know, the, the concepts of you know asset management and control over the assets is, uh, you know, I can't measure what I can't or I can't manage what I can't measure. Mm -hmm. So really stressing the importance of metrics and the correct metrics. Um, I mean, it, there's no other way to manage things unless I have some objective criteria by which to manage it. And so in the book, there's just some suggestions of things that you can put in place to, um, you know, help manage what you what you're building. Yeah. Yep. It's got to be it's got to be something that you can measure and and react to. Right. That's one of the things I've learned is that you can collect lots of information, but if you're not going to react to it there's potentially not a good reason for it, right? If you want something that's a meaningful statistic that you can do something with, and you maybe right. don't need a thousand of them, you maybe need 10 of them to start with, then they're key risk indicators that you can actually act on. Right, and this is oftentimes places where it makes sense to bring in, you know, maybe a third party or buy a tool, right? There's SIM solutions, there's out outsourced SIM solutions that can give you good metrics on things that are going on in your environment. You know, if you've got a help desk, that's processing tickets, you know, in security incidents. I mean, there's other things you can implement there. Uh, a lot of people are outsourcing their security operations center, you know, their SOC that's tying into SIEM. So there's a lot of different things that you can use for metrics to measure the performance of your information security program. Uh, what we use in terms of our assessment, you know, is the FISA score. You start with a FISA score of a 470, and you do all this work over the course of the 12 months, and you end up with a score of 450. Well, Oops, <laughs> right? That doesn't happen, or it shouldn't happen, assuming that you planned well. Uh, but we want to be able to report to executive management and the board of directors on a regular basis four things. And I think you can make a case for five things. The first thing is what's the current state of our information security program? What's our future state of our information security program? When are we going to get there? How much is it going to cost? And the fifth thing is is what's our most significant risk? What's the number one thing that we're working on right now? If you can communicate those things consistently to executive management, and it should be in, in, in line with what your plan was, right? The thing that they signed off on. Right now you've got a nice, you know, a nice feedback loop that I'll mm -hmm. be continue to build. Yep, for sure. So, all right. Well, any, any questions? We've got, what, if just a few minutes left? Five minutes? Any questions? Anybody got any input for us? You know, Kit, Brian, it's, it was cool talking to you. I felt like I had a friend. <laughs> oh, I'm glad too. I won't like having a friend. Yeah, not like these other people aren't friends either. They just don't interact as much and stuff. Well, they've had a lot of good stuff to say on the way through. I appreciate it all. Maybe, oh, Brandon, sure. do you have any uh, particular ones over here who have a question? Any hand raised? No, nope, just the one. We had the one hand raise, and looks like that was that was productive. So I haven't seen anything else come through. All right. So chapter two, bad foundation. Spend time on the foundation. It's time well spent. It's not fun. It's not easy, uh, but it really is critical, you know, to the success of your security program and your security efforts. It is, and it's it's uh, you know when we talk when we talk with, with organizations on how to help build the program, it's always the ones that I kind of tell them is the cornerstone too. It's you're you're going to have to have these things in place before you can move on. If you try to move on to uh, you know some of the other information security principles, you're going to find that without these in place, it's very hard. You can't you can't easily work on like you said mobile devices or remote access or um, vulnerability management because none of those things can happen without these place first so right. gotta have them. even incident management I remember the work I did on the target breach uh, the struggle they had in identifying what the, who owned the video server mm -hmm. right? the video server had port 3389 uh, access so you know it wasn't really isolation it was half-assed isolation into the cardholder data environment into the store environments and the struggle in a big organization with millions and millions of dollars in tools and awesome security talent and they struggled for days in determining who owns this video server and should it have access into the cardholder data environment simple fundamental questions that i think if we if if, if asset management would have been you know more mm -hmm. in play there 
less time spent on tools and flashy lights and more time spent on fundamentals and foundational stuff, uh, it certainly would help them in their incident management as well. So it helps in all parts of your security program. Um, big companies and small companies like big companies obviously are, are harder to do. You have to get a lot more people involved and that's a little more complicated, but um, you know, big, you'd have to do it eventually. Yeah. No, it's true. I see Robert asked about PCI compliance because we're talking about cardholder data. And it's certainly, if you look in the DSS, you're going to find the same themes, right? They're the same kind of, uh, same kind of requirements in there that you have to have application ownership assigned. Again, if you're going to start figuring out how your cardholder data looks like, that's, that's understanding first off, what's the data? And then how do you identify it as cardholder data so that you can build out what your cardholder environment is? So you're right. It's, it's definitely part of all good compliance frameworks is going to be these foundational security concepts. Well, back in the target days, it was PCI DSS, I think, 3.0, 3.1. Now it's PCI DSS 3.2. So back in the target days, the guidance was in terms of, I don't know if you were referring to the isolation versus segmentation piece of PCI compliance in the cardholder data environment, but uh, back then it was segmentation, right? That was kind of the push. And so some people would interpret that to be, well, I've got a VLAN, right? <laughs> yep. I've got layer two segmentation, so that must be segmentation. And then there were others who in interpreted that as being isolation after the target breach and the Home Depot breach right after that. Then there was more definition from the council, the PCI standards council, on what they actually meant by isolation. So it is addressed in PCI DSS now. It wasn't so much back then. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Now I've got this whole like hour and a half to go find this place that you told me about that I can observe airplanes or things. I may have looked it up at the beginning of the call. It said it's on concourse D. So I can't tell where you are, but you look like I'm you're, D. oh, you're in A. E. So it's, uh, it says it's in D. You'll find it. You have to go. It's, um, there's like a little food court. You go through the food court. There's one of those square areas with a bunch of gates all the way kind of around. And I it's like food. second floor. Watch for the staircase and uh, go check it out. It's pretty cool. I don't know of any other place like that in the airport anymore. They don't mostly. I may like not make it past the food court. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope, I hope you do. Right? Yeah. I'm traveling, man. You're allowed to just get a free pass on your diet when you're traveling. That's true. That's true. All right, All right. Guys. Well, well, if anybody well, has any additional questions afterwards, please follow up with us. Email us. You know, we're, we're here to help. So let us know what sure. you do. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, lot guys. for having me. Uh, just a reminder, we are going to be sending out the recording to this session. Um, it did get a little bit goofy with Evan kind of dropping off there for a second, but uh, we should have the majority of it up for you. Um, and I'll get that out to you in an email as well. Um, also, obviously, Evan's going to be doing this again next month, so be on the lookout for uh, information to sign up for that, too. And other than that, uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, day and week, and thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Thank right. you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye. Hello, Mo.